Good evening. You can see we have a new setup. We're going to we're experimenting tonight with this uh, this setup. So I hope you'll you'll let us know whether it's better or worse or whatever. Um, but what we thought was that you would um, have a chance to talk to one another in between the talk and the questions, and you know you might get your thoughts together and ask some good questions. Uh, also, sometimes you hear you go to a lecture and it goes in one ear and out the other. But if we talk about it a little bit more, sometimes it you know it sticks. So those are the kinds of reasons. But anyway, I'm so happy that you're here. Uh, for those who don't know don't know me yet, my name is Sister Kathy Duffy, and I'm the director of the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College. It's a regional center for the study of science and spirituality. And so we really are regional. We're going to do programs. Our advisory committee is going to do a program over in Bryn Mawr at the Episcopal Church there. And so uh, we have a whole, you know, seven... Uh, seven days over there. So we're trying to spread out as much as we can and do what we can in these areas. So I'd like to welcome you here to the, Sugar, the college's Sugarloaf campus and tonight's event. And uh, a particularly warm welcome to those of you who are new. I see a few new faces. Um, the Institute is, I was established four years ago. We're beginning our fifth year now. And we promote the constructive dialogue or engagement of religion, spirituality with science, technology, and encourage a dialogue that's interfaith, multi-science, and civil. Uh, we sponsor lectures, a reading circle, and other events. And if anyone has ideas, we'd like to you know, try to work them out. Uh, it, it, it do check our website. Someone told me they're having trouble with it, but I think we fixed it. So there, there are cards on the back with the, 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 you know, the website. It's just um, irans, I-R-A-N-D-S dot org. And um, hopefully it'll be working well. Um, we also have a blog that's not all that active, but we really are going strong with Twitter. We have a wonderful Twitter master. Is that what you call him? <laughs> so check it out. It's, very, it's really fascinating. <laughs> but don't stay on all day. So if, if you um, didn't sign, if you aren't on our mailing list, be sure to sign at the, the desk because we do... I try not to spam you. Probably don't send enough emails, but um, you know I'll send every every time we have a new conf a, a new event. I'll send something out, and that way you'll be on, in touch. The other thing on our website too is the videos. We're starting finally to get them up. I think we have about 12 of our previous lectures on the website, and uh, we hope to do it more regularly now. We've we've been miss miss uh, not doing very well over the last year, but we'll be better. So today tonight we are very fortunate to have as our guest my dear friend Ursula King, Dr. Ursula King is uh, an internationally renowned scholar on spirituality, interfaith dialogue, women and religion, and most especially, Teilhard de Chardin. She received her PhD in 1977 from King's College, University of London, and honorary doctorates from Edinburgh University, Oslo University, and the University of Dayton in Ohio as well as research awards from the University of Delhi and the Sorbonne in Paris. She is a life fellow of the Royal Society for the Encouragement of the Arts. Presently, Ursula is Professor Emerita of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Bristol, where she held the Chair of Theology and Religious Studies after teaching for many years at the University of Leeds in London and in India. Um, she has served as visiting professor in feminist theology at the University of Oslo, distinguished Bingham Professor of Humanities at the University of Louisville, Kentucky, and has held the Brueggemann Chair in Interreligious Studies at Xavier University, Cincinnati. 
She is currently Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies, University of Bristol, Professorial Research Associate in the Department of the Study of Religions, School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, and a Vice President of the World Congress of Faith. And in her spare time, she comes here to talk with us. <laughs> right? She really lectures all over the place, and you know she's been really very, very active, um, especially these last few years in doing retreats on uh, on tape and and that. Uh, uh, Professor King has published and broadly and broadcasts widely, especially on women and spirituality, gender issues, and world religions, and the French thinker Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Among her Publications are The Search for Spirituality, uh, Christian Mystics, um, and uh, her publications on Teilhard include Christ in All Things, Teilhard de Chardin and Eastern Religions, The Spirit of Earth, and best of all, the, the, what I would call, and many others would agree with me, the very best um, biography of Teilhard called The Spirit of Fire. It has just come out, a new edition of that book has just come out. There's a copy back there if you want to look. Someone has already bought it. But um, they're flyers if you want to uh, you know, take them along with you. Ursula's current research is concerned with contemporary spirituality, comparative gender perspectives in different world religions, and women in interfaith dialogue. A wonderful contribution, especially in this day, when so many of us hope to enhance the place of women in the church. So there's a lot, I mean, I already said a lot, I probably said too much, but I, I, I could keep going, but I think it, you came to hear Ursula, not me. And so let's give a hand to Ursula and thank her for coming to be with us. Well, thank you for this very generous and lively introduction. It's very hard to live up to this, but I shall try, shall try. I love coming here. I was here last year as uh, my very good friend Kathy organized a wonderful session last year and again this year. So I'm really very, very happy to come back here. I love being in Philadelphia and particularly at Chestnut Hill College. It's very inspiring and we can wonderfully exchange ideas and discuss things and see how, how far our interpretation of Teya matches or doesn't match. And we first met, I think it's a over, not quite 15 years ago, but 13 years ago at a wonderful conference at Villanova on the works of love. And we have been working together ever since. And that's been really a very strong bond. And we have been together to China, looking at Teya's excavations and some of his work there. And we have been together to other places. So it's been really great. And uh, I want to speak today on something that some of you may be familiar with or may not be familiar with, but my talk is called Following the Road of Fire, and you will see why I say this. And this is about the emergence of Teilhard's pan christic mysticism during the First World War. Now, I can't go much into Teilhard's life. You can read about this. Uh, born in 1881, he died in 1955, but the two very formative and, and essential uh, shaping factors of his personality were the First World War and the experience of China, where he spent almost 23 years, from 1923 to 1946. And you can see this from this little quotation. When he went on his first expedition to China, to Mongolia, he came back and he said, I'm a pilgrim of the future on my way back from a journey made entirely in the past, looking for early human origins for paleontological remains. And that was Mongolia. And it was at that uh, excavation, after that excavation, that he wrote 
the Mass on the World, which is a very mystical text that some of you will know. Now, the second, uh, the, the first was the war, the second one was China. And he wrote, when he went to Mongolia, he wrote the period in Mongolia, like the war, this is the First World War, is rather like a retreat for me in that it leads me to the heart of the unique greatness of God. That's an extraordinary statement. But you can see the First World War and his experience of China, where he was to some extent exiled because his superiors didn't want him to teach biology, paleontology from an evolutionary perspective. And they found this too threatening. So they sent him off to do more expeditions and work in China. So these were these two great retreats. And he says in his spiritual biography, it was like two great winds that swept him almost off his feet. The experience of the First World War and the experience of China. So it's like an arc. And I would have to speak more than an hour to explain all this to you. And this evening I am concentrating on the First World War because that was a true crucible of fire for him. He speaks someone whom the Lord has drawn to follow the road of fire. So that like many Christian mystics, the image of fire is one of the most frequently used metaphors throughout his writings. The four and a half years he lived in the trenches was such a deeply formative experience for him because it forged together the diverse strands of a rich mystical vision grounded in a fervent Catholic faith, a thorough knowledge of theology, of patristics and the Christian mystics, as well as a passionate study of evolutionary science, human origins, and the future development of humanity. His all-embracing universal vision centered on the cosmic Christ. But this had begun to, made, to emerge earlier during his theological studies in Hastings in the south of England. You know, the French Jesuits were expelled. They were closed in France because of the anti-clerical stance of the French government. So when Teilhard had just started being a Jesuit, when he had entered his novitiate, they were all sent off out of France, they were expelled, and he finished up doing all his studies, first on the island of Jersey in the Channel, uh, Channel Island, and then in Hastings, in the south of England, where you have very steep cliffs, uh, and very many fossils can be found there. So whenever he could, he was off hunting for fossils, apart from studying for his philosophy and theology exams. But it was during that time, he finished his studies in 1912. In 1911, in Hastings, the year during which he was ordained, actually, he was ordained in August 1911, he read Bergson's book on creative evolution, and that really swept him off his feet. In a way, it was the answer to what he had been seeking and thinking about. It was a real great discovery, and it completely transformed all his understanding, action, and prayer life, as he explained um, 40 years later in his autobiographical essay, The Heart of Matter. But what happens now, he doesn't start to write immediately. He goes off to Paris and starts his doctorate in science, because he wanted to become a specialist in paleontology. So he is in, in Paris, which is uh, another very important chapter, because this was suddenly the opening of the world for him. He met again his cousin who he had last seen during childhood games, but she was by then the principal of a very uh, well-known Catholic girls' school, and she had friends in philosophy. He, and. He, she introduced Teilhard uh, to all sorts of salons and discussion groups and so on. So for him, this was suddenly coming out of a uh, boarding school, coming out of the seminary. He was now in the big world, um, Paris in the 1910s to 20s were, was an exciting place to be. So then, of course, the studies that he began after two years were interrupted by the outbreak of the First World War. And like all the other Frenchmen, he was called up to go to war. So 
He's now in a situation of extraordinarily different circumstances, and that really changed very profoundly. And he starts writing, and he writes a series of very stirring lyrical essays, which he wanted to leave as his testament should he die in the war. Now, this is just the context, and I will say more about it in a moment. In a book of First World War poetry, it is said that it is perhaps the poetry to which that war gave birth, which is the most poignant legacy and which will be the most enduring memorial to the millions of dead and wounded, monstrous act of folly. I want to argue that Thea's poignant expression of a most powerful spiritual vision of the presence of God in all of nature and life, including the most violent aspects of life, also belongs to the legacy of the First World War and should be given far more attention than it has been given. He first began to write in the trenches in a most extraordinary setting in 1916 where during intermittent moments between the most violent battles he could find the time and opportunity to write down his reflections on the world, on humanity, and God. These essays are not poetry in a formal sense, but they possess a great poetic and mystical quality. And the French, if you read French, is really rapturous. And they were not edited not published until after his death, in fact, 10 years after his death. In 1965, we have the first French editions of Les Écrits du Temps de la Guerre, published, uh, translated in English in 1968 as Writings in Time of War, and they convey a deep love of life, of the earth and humanity, and of God, and especially of the cosmic Christ. And these understandings are all related to a deep understanding of the dynamic of evolutionary becoming. So you have here really a very, very strong unfolding or description of a vision of the unity of Christ and the universe, the unfinished universe growing and evolving. So what I want to do now, I want to give you first a broader context of Teilhard's war, war experience and, and his writings. Then I will comment on his war essays, in particularly two or three, and then come to some concluding comments. So let us look at the wider context in which these essays first came into the world, so to speak. After more than 10 years spent as a Jesuit novice student, teacher, and researcher, Teilhard was called up for service in December 1914 and joined his regiment in January, on January 22, 1915. Although ordained a priest in 1911, he did not work as a chaplain, as he could have done, but at his own wish, he was enlisted as an ordinary soldier. He wanted to be with the man. So as a non-combatant priest, he worked as a stretcher bearer, which was one of the lowest positions in the French army. He was attached to Moroccan ambulance unit that became part of a light infantry regiment and contained Tunisians, Moroccans, and European settlers in North Africa. This mixed human milieu of his regiment also included other groups from the French colonial empire, such as Senegalese, Matikin, people from Martinique, Somalis, Anamites, and Tunisians. So, you have a very mixed human value. It is, in fact, Teilhard discovers humanity or the diversity of humanity during the war. He had discovered the, the sense of the cosmic, the, the richness of nature, the history of nature, everything that made his, up his cosmic dimension, he had discovered that before. He discovers the human and the Christic really in the war. His intensive experience of looking after the wounded and dying, often acting as a substitute partner to the Muslim soldiers who didn't have a, a chaplain, provide much of the subtext of his early writings. 
What the harsh life in the trenches meant on a day-to-day -day basis for the wounded, the stretcher bearers, the nurses, the medical orderlies and officers is today far better known than ever before because special studies have come out, particularly in English, about what the medic, what the doctors did in the army during this First World War, what the medical orderlies did, what the volunteers did, what the stretcher bearers did, and it is an extraordinary story. I can tell you, if you have ever had a chance, I've read this very, very extensively, and I've got notes on this, but I can't say too much about it because there's not enough time. It is extraordinary, but it gives us much help to reimagine under what material conditions their spiritual and mystical vision first emerged and found expression in words. You see, for example, it is now known there were not enough, not only not enough stretcher bearers, there were not enough stretchers to take all the wounded on. So they, they found the solution to take the ladders from the trenches that had been abandoned, and they used the trenches to just shove off, get all the wounded out, out of the danger zone. Then the stretcher bearer were very busy. They had to help to dig the graves, to to bury the wounded, they had to also sometimes give uh, um, medical care, me uh, remittance medical care when there are no doctors uh, available. And some of the chaplains, this is the chaplains now, described later how they could only remember the eyes of the man about to die and the faces of the dead because there were so many of them. And this is particularly true around about to um, 1916 about the Battle of Verdun, one of the worst battles. One English chaplain, for example, wrote that he spent three years, three holy weeks on the Western Front where he saw more deaths and more suffering than he had ever seen before. And that he came through this experience, he came to understand the true meaning of the passion of Christ. So, I mean, these are conditions in extremis. We can't really fully uh, visualize what this meant, how to live like that. Teyas Regiment was one of the last to be formed, but it soon gained recognition for distinguished service and came to be counted among the best. On joining, Teya described his situation as being partly among non-believers, but he said, there are no lack of Christians, but I'm the only priest in the regiment. Looking after the wounded, he sometimes felt helpless when it comes to dealing with the native troops, he writes, because of the difference in language and the gulf that separates the two mentalities. His regiment was constantly on the move. It took part in in battles on the Western Front, from Ypres to Passchendaele in Belgium, Arras, Dunkirk, Verdun, and Marne in France. It has been estimated very recently uh, that during his four and a half years of active service, Teilhard took part in 67 battles. It was a bloody, dirty war where Teilhard felt almost daily at the brink of death, uncertain whether there would still be life tomorrow. The extremes of this situation were truly a crucible of fire, which he called a baptism of the real that forced him to give his best, to test the strength of his face and focus his inner vision by welding it to the concrete struggles of suffering humanity. The Muslim soldiers and their French officers, some of whom were atheists, greatly appreciated Teilhard's presence. Indifferent to the perils of life in the trenches, Teilhard emerged unscathed from all the battle he experienced, all the battles he experienced at close hand. Working as an active stretcher bearer under the savage conditions of the World War battlefields, looking after the wounded, the dying and the dead who had to be buried, it seems almost miraculous that he was never ever wounded himself, not even a single shell wound. The soldiers of his regiment came to believe that he was especially protected by Baraka, by divine power and grace. They called their Monsieur Teilhard affectionately Sidi Marabou, a 
title of great esteem and honor, which refers to North Africa, Sidney refers to North African settled in France, so they must have seen him as one of theirs, whereas Marabou means a man closely bound to God, a saint and ascetic, blessed with divine favor, who enjoys the safe protection of God. Now, when you think of the 8.4 million Frenchmen who were mobilized during the First World War, 1.4 million died. So that's just one statistic. I don't want to give you all the statistics about First World War. And Teya never had as much as a wound. discharged his daily duties as stretcher bearer under almost constant enemy fire without fear. He refused all promotion, but his efforts attracted praise and public comment. Each year of the war, he was cited in army dispatches that described him as a model of bravery, self-sacrificing coolness, a man, with, a man with contempt for danger, whose sterling character won him the confidence and respect of all. He was given several war decorations, and at the request of his old regiment, he was made a Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur after the war. The award of this honor was accompanied by a laudatory description that summed up his war efforts for the outside world, citing an outstanding stretcher bearer who during four years of active service was in every battle and engagement the regiment took part in, applying to remain in the ranks in order that he might be with the man whose dangers and hardships he constantly shared." End of quote. Yet the war meant much more than battles, dangers, and hardship to him. It is truly astonishing what a surprising amount of work he got done between all the exhaustion of battle. With heightened sensibility and some might say extraordinary detachment, he went for lonely walks between the battles, reflected in solitude, and sensed the urgent need to clarify his ideas so that he could put them down on paper. He even conceived of the idea of the no-sphere in that situation. He was asking himself, what was the meaning of all life and of his own? Where was God in these fields of death and battle? What was humanity aiming for? What is, his, what is the role of the Christian face in the immense cosmic process that is the evolution of life? He started a war journal, made notes, wrote letters, especially to his cousin Marguerite, and composed a series of deeply moving, passionate, and inspiring essays. He wrote them for himself, but he also wrote them for the world, for he wanted to make others see what he saw, felt, and believe. So he writes, so I started to think again and to jot down in an exercise book some notes about a subject that has always been for me the real problem of my interior life. It is how to reconcile progress and detachment, a passionate and legitimate love of the Earth's highest development and the exclusive quest for the kingdom of heaven. How can one be as much a Christian as any other man and yet more a man than anyone? He wanted to be both an outstanding Christian and an outstanding human being. His journal, his diary that is, in which he noted down day ideas almost daily, contains the seeds of his thought, the initial plans of his essays, later written out with a meticulous hand in full length between the spells of battle on A4 sheets with lines, all lined and with a very fine, clean, beautiful handwriting. Between 19, April 1916 and the end of the war in November 1990, when they were demobilized, Teya wrote a total of 13 essays, followed by another five before he left the army in early March 1919. These essays, as I said, were only published in 1965, 10 years after his death. Unfortunately, these foundational essays, which are really the foundation of for everything he wrote later, remained relatively unknown and little commented, relatively little commented upon. He had little success in getting these essays published as he would have liked to have done. He got just one published. 
aware, very early, aware, aware of the originality and newness of his ideas, he realized early on how difficult it would be for his ideas to become known, except he wrote to his cousin, except in conversation or manuscript form, passed surreptitiously from hand to hand. This prophetic remark made at the end of 1916 described exactly what happened to his works over the next 40 years. Almost none were to be published during his lifetime. Yet the war essays contain the germs of all his later ideas. Here we find already his urgent concern for the reinterpretation of Christianity, the need for a new image of God, the quest for practically engaged spirituality appropriate to the needs of the contemporary world. All themes not merely worked out intellectually, but experientially rooted and developed through daily pastoral contact with men from very different religious, cultures, and social backgrounds. Now, I hope that these few remarks will give you at least a sketch of the milieu in which Teilhard's ideas developed were finding some mature expression and were written down during this extraordinary situation of the First World War. Now we'll say something about the essays. The alluring appeal of the beauty of nature resonates through every one of Teilhard's war writings. This is all the more remarkable because it is an appeal largely based on his own memory and creative imagination, for there was little beauty to be found in the trenches of the First World War, except perhaps during the lull of battle, in rare moments of rest in the surrounding woods and countryside before much of it came to be destroyed. This intensity of feeling, the celebration of life and sensuous beauty, the palpable concreteness as well as the spiritual depths of his vision vibrates through all the war essays. They are full of lyrical poetry that makes Teilhard's works, to quote his French biographer Claude Cunot, it makes his work rank with the finest of the world's religious poetry. Many passages in these war essays are preludes to his later, much better known works, The Mess on the World of 1923 and The Divine Milieu, 1927. But these are mature expression of what emerged during the First World War and what you find in some of the essays. Looking back at these early war writings towards the end of his life, Teilhard recognized then uh, that they were absolutely foundational, and he continued to refer to them throughout his life. However, they, contain, they also contain nothing that was not expressed again, though differently, in later writings. Some of these early ideas eventually found their final shape in his magnum opus, the book The A Human Phenomenon, completed in 1940, but also not published until after his death. The war experience was for him the culmination of a long drawn out inner development whereby all his early impressions came together into one, fused into a large universal perspective that henceforth was to carry him through the changing tides of life. The essays deal with many different topics I've, and, and deserve detailed study, which would take a whole semester at least. I've chosen to concentrate here on some major examples of Teilhard's pan mysticism. References to Christ are found throughout the war essays, especially in the prayer sections that accompany some of them. I've selected three particularly striking examples of 1916 and 1917, beginning with his first essay, Cosmic Life of 1916, followed by Christ in Meta, also of 1916, and some very brief reference to the mystical milieu of 1917. So let us look at these essays. Teilhard had a deep desire to leave his intellectual testament, as I've already mentioned, in case he did not return from the front. 
In the early months of 1916, when he had just been in the trenches for a year, he wrote with a great sense of urgency the first of his writings, a long essay of 60 pages entitled Cosmic Life, completed on the 24th of April 1916 near Dunkirk, and soon followed by many more essays. Cosmic Life is preceded by the motto to Terra Mater, that is to say to Mother Earth, and through her above all to Christ Jesus. It is in and through Mother Earth, through the life of nature and the world, that incarnate divine life is encountered and felt in its full dimension. This is why this first essay is preceded by the affirmation there is communion with God, the communion with God that usually religious people have pursued. There is communion with earth, which other people might pursue, and a communion with God through earth. In other words, there is a vertical from the world to God, a horizontal just being immersed in the world and its development, but there is a, there is a third, a third direction, which is not a synthesis of the two, but something new that tries to commune with God by the development of the earth. The essay is signed Dunkirk Easter Week, April 1916. In the midst of terrible battles, surrounded by the experience of death, Teilhard opens his essay with an extraordinary affirmation of life. The first line reads, I'm writing these lines from an exuberance of life and a yearning to live. It is written to express an impassioned vision of the earth and in an attempt to find a solution for the doubts that beset my action. Because I love the universe, its energies, its secrets, its hopes, and because at the same time I'm dedicated to God. I want to express my love of matter and life and to reconcile if possible with the unique reconcile it if possible with the unique adoration of the only absolute and definitive Godhead. So cosmic life describes Tiyas awakening to the cosmos which had happened through a number of years during his studies and also when he taught for three years in a Jesuit school in Egypt and used to go on um, excavations into the desert to find fossils. It describes the vision of the unity and structure of the cosmos that he had first experienced as what he calls a temptation of matter, but that he now understands as a communion with Earth. This communion refers to realization of cosmic consciousness. This is the word he uses, and he had learned about cosmic consciousness that Buck, the American author, had written about. He had learned about this as early as 1910. He really feels he had an experience of nature, mysticism, and what we would call today panentheism. In future years, Teilhard understood this communion with Earth also as a political and social engagement, as a passionate struggle to develop all human and natural resources and build a world of peace and justice. But such communion, so important and necessary, was nonetheless a stage that had to lead to more. It had to be transformed and grow into a fuller vision of communion with God through Earth. This is linked to two important insights, the cosmic Christ on one hand and the holiness of evolution, insights he had first awakened to in 1911 when he encountered evolution. He remembered his earlier initiation into the cosmos as a temptation, a crisis that his face and the discovery of evolution had helped him to overcome. In the evolutionary process of life, he discovered the rhythm and breath of spirit, the lineaments of the face and hands of God, the taking shape of what he called the cosmic Christ. His first essay culminates in a moving, deeply personal and mystical prayer to Christ, which I will briefly quote from. It's quite a long prayer. He writes, Lord Jesus Christ, you truly contain within your gentleness, within your humanity, all the unyielding immensity and grandeur of the world. He loved this word, the grandeur of the world. 
I love you, Lord Jesus, because of the multitude who shelter within you and whom, if one clings closely to you, one can hear with all the other beings murmuring, praying, weeping. Think of the soldiers murmuring, praying, weeping. You, the center at which all things meet and which stretches out over all things so as to draw them back into itself, I love you for the extensions of your body and soul to the farthest corner of creation through grace, through life, and through matter. Lord Jesus, you are as gentle as the human heart, as fiery as the forces of nature, as intimate as life itself. You in whom I can melt away and with whom I must have mastery and freedom. I love you as a world, as this world which has captivated my heart. And it is you, I now realize, that my brother man, even those who do not believe, sense and seek throughout the magic immensities of the cosmos. The essay finishes with a statement, to live the cosmic life is to live dominated by the consciousness that one is an atom in the body of the mystical and cosmic Christ. You see, you see his Christ mysticism there. The man who so lives dismisses as irrelevant a host of preoccupations that absorb the interests of other men. His life is projected further and it is, his heart is more widely receptive. There you have my intellectual testament. That's the closing words. You can see already in this, word, in this formulation, the person who is so engaged, so taken up with this vision of, of grandeur of the world and the divine presence within this grandeur that suffuses it, he dismisses the host of press preoccupations that absorb the interests of others, the life is projected further. You can see this anti what the theologian John Hort calls the anticipatory vision, the future to come, the way the unfinished universe has to be completed. So that it's a very important essay which has many other passages to it. But I just wanted to show you that you know this mystical expression it comes out right from the first time he puts his pen to paper, but he's in this war situation. Now, similar uh, vision is, is conveyed in his uh, third essay, Christ in the World of Matter, which was signed on 14th October 1916. He completed this in the form of three stories entitled Christ in the World of Matter. This is, by the way, not in the English edition of Writings in Time of the War. It's found in Hymn of the Universe. He completed this essay 10 days before the vigorous battle to recapture Fort Douaumont, the most formidable of the forts guarding the walled city of Verdun, which the Germans had captured in February 1916, and the French recaptured on October 24, 1916. So the army, they were all waiting. They, they knew that this battle was going to come. They weren't you know, held on tenterhooks. Everybody was ready at the bottom of this fort to have this onslaught as soon as, you know, the battle would start. Teilhard finished this essay with words, dated October 14, 1916. He writes, I tell you this, I shall go into this engagement in a religious spirit with all my soul, borne on by a single great impetus in which I am unable to distinguish where human emotions end and adoration begins. And if I'm destined not to return from those heights, the hill on which the fort was situated, if I'm destined not to return, in other words, if I die, I would like my body to be remain there, mold into the clay of the fortifications like a living cement thrown by God into the stonework of the new city, the new city which is going to, we have to build. Christ in the World of Matter, this essay from which I've just quoted, bears the subtitle, Three Stories in the Style of Benson. In other words, it's an essay that was inspired by the mystical novels of R.H. Benson. He was the son of a former Archbishop of Canterbury who converted to Catholicism and wrote mystical novels about his own mystical experience, and Taylor liked those a great deal. 
Tia writes here, at his most personal and intimate, describing a vision of Christ in a picture, a monstrance, and a pix, vessels in which the sacred host is kept. And the stories are told as if coming from a friend, described as now dead and buried in the earth around Verdun, I mean, this poetic license. He speaks of his friend as going into church to pray in front of a picture of the sacred heart, but he's really describing his own experience. He has a powerful vision of the picture suddenly expanding towards infinity, and the lines and the face and figure of Christ are melting away into the universe. The entire world is vibrant with movement, with life emanating from Christ's heart, the dazzling center of matter. Here, Teilhard describes for the first time the radiant power, majesty, and beauty of Christ, an experience and theme to which he returned in later years again and again. He writes about Christ's garments and gaze, the beauty of his eyes, the expression of both immense joy and suffering. Then he moves on to the Eucharistic host and its mysterious expansion. So he writes that the whole world had become incandescent, had itself become like a giant single host. Ardently gazing into the pupils of Christ's eyes, he describes himself as dumbfounded before these abysses of fiery, fascinating life. He could not decide whether their powerful final expression denoted, I quote, an indescribable agony or a superabundant triumphant joy. But he knew he caught a glimpse of these absorbing eyes once again in the glance of a dying soldier. For him now, God is at the heart of everything. That is why even the war could not disconcert him. That's what he writes. And why he could still maintain equanimity when faced with the most tremendous, terrible battles of the First World War. He was endowed with the strength of an extraordinary face and the power of a deeply discerning spirituality. A gift of grace that enabled him to transform even the sufferings and the violent loss of life on the battlefield into an experience where he could sense the presence of God. Less personal but more reflective on mystical experience and cosmic life is the mystical milieu uh, written in 1917, a year later. He quotes the experiences described in this essay as only an introduction to mysticism. But this mysticism, this essay in particular, points already to the rich vision of what he later calls the divine milieu, a milieu that is both a radiant center and a surrounding environment in which we are fully immersed, in which we live and breathe. He describes in this essay the progress of the mystic in a series of five expanding circles. I will only give a few quotations. I will not speak about this in any detail, but because Kathleen Duffy has written this wonderful book which shows clearly to our spiritual development and mystical experience that how it unfolded in interdependence with his scientific understanding and is so closely linked to the cosmic rhythm of evolution becoming. So looking at these five circles that Tejas describes, a cycle, circle of presence, consistency, energy, spirit, and person, she un unfolds, she shows us how this is so much linked to his scientific knowledge so that she can actually describe this essay as so aptly as the inner face of evolution that led Teilhard to discover the heart of God at the center of an evolutionary world. And I very much recommend this beautiful book which provides a close reading of Teilhard's mystical experience, catching the fine radiance of what Teilhard saw and experienced first during the First World War, but then throughout his life, so that it conveys much of the audacity, originality, and powerful attraction of Teilhard's new mysticism, which is steeped in a synthesis of faith and science that many are longing for today.
So I, I just give one or two quotes. In this essay, he describes how the seer, le voyant, he loved this work, the seer, the mystic, is immersed in a universal milieu higher than that which contains the restlessness of ordinary, sensibly apprehended life, apprehended life. A milieu, he writes, that knows no change, immune to the search of superficial vicissitude, a homogeneous milieu in which contrasts and differences are toned down. And the ecstatic experience of ultimate unity makes the mystic cry out, the world is filled and filled with the absolute. To see this is to be made free. So he writes, the mystic was looking for the devouring fire which he could identify with the divine that summons him from all sides. Science points it out to him. So obviously there are scientific roots and context for Teilhard's experiences. The science points it out to him and Teilhard cries out, see, the universe is ablaze. And the mystic is plunged into an ocean of energy from which he draws undiluted joy. What he saw, we could discuss much about what he writes about the mystical milieu and about this mysticism and love of Christ and the way he discovered God in the process of becoming even within the context of war. And it seems to us, you know, from a far distance, almost superhuman, but extraordinary, certainly, that he could experience this process of becoming in the midst of war, that he could feel the presence of God amidst strife, see the human and divine intermingle and take face and shape in the person of Jesus, who in truth, he writes, must be loved as the world. Now I want to comment, uh, I have many more passages here, but I haven't really got time to read all those out. I want to come to some comments on Teilhard's heart and fire mysticism. I began with saying the First World War was like a crucible of fire that Teilhard, for Teilhard, where in all his ex previous experiences became fused together into one great mystical vision that compelled him to write in order to pass on this vision and communicate to others what he had experienced and seen. Remember, seeing plays such a primary position in his whole worldview. Seeing, not just seeing with your eyes, but this inner seeing, seeing the totality of things, seeing the universal blaze, seeing the div div divine diaphany, seeing God, meeting God in the blazing development and unfolding of matter. So. He was forced, he, he felt compelled to write in order to pass on this vision and communicate what he had experienced and seen with such urgency that he could even, he couldn't wait till the war had finished. He might not survive. So he must write now, now in the middle of these battles. So he felt he recognized this living being as God incarnate, present in the stream of becoming of becoming as a Christic element in all things. He speaks about this Christic element that he names later the God of evolution, the universal Christ, and Christ Omega. The symbolism of fire was to recur in his writings again and again in later years. This fire was fueled by his real living contact with an immense world, a world of fossils, bones, stones, rocks, plants, animals, places, peoples, friendships, and idea. He spoke of fire as a spark, a glow, a blaze, as flames that illuminate and set alight and consume. So I think it seems to me very appropriate to characterize him by the metaphor that he uses so often, namely that of fire, flame, and spark. He is really, truly a spirit of fire who followed the road of fire throughout his life and writings. He was a man of deep thought and faith, but also of great depths of feeling. 
compassionate thinker rather than merely an intellectual one. And this is evident for many of his letters, diary entries and essays, and especially the spiritual autobiography, The Heart of Matter, written in 1915, five years before his death, where he retraces his spiritual development and the growth and emergence of his inner integral vision. But this vision is there from his very first essay on cosmic life, celebrated in communion with God through the world. So this is very important to understand that. Another important, unusual element in Teilhard's spirituality is his emphasis on the feminine, which he calls the unitive element. By this he refers particularly to the love he had experienced through the influence of several women in his life. Initially, the nurturing presence of his mother, the love of his sisters and cousins, and later his lasting friendships with a number of outstandingly creative women. It was through these experiences that he really felt that the universe is suffused by love. Love is a secret thread that runs through the universe, the outpouring of the spirit over all unexplored paths, as he wrote. He argued that humanity has to harness the powers of love to develop them to a much greater potential than ever before. Human beings need love as much as they need light, oxygen, and vitamins. We need love to be well, whole, and connected in communion and union. His understanding of love refers not only to love between individuals, but envisages a new kind of love that creates the strongest bonds across the whole human community. This is what he understood by building up the earth. He called for what he, of course, he, as he was, as was his once, he creates a new word. He called for the amorization of planetary humanity and the whole universe. So you know perhaps his famous quotation from an essay on the evolution of chastity, which he finishes with the following words in 1934, he wrote, someday after mastering the winds and the waves, the tides and gravity, we shall harness for God the energies of love. And then for a second time in the history of the world, humanity will have discovered fire. There is the fire again. Nowhere is this vision of fire, of love, more radiant and empowering than in the description of his mystical experiences. They truly express a vision of fire that filled him with wonder and amazement. Oh, and he, he also, you, you know, the, the mess on the world in 1923 is preceded by the war essay, The Priest of July 8, 1918, which, which are sort of pre-runs, if you like, of the book The Divine Milieu, written in 1927, and The Heart of Matter, written in 1950, followed by his culminating essay, The Christic, written 1955, six weeks before his death. All these essays together express what Teilhard always said, that all his life he felt he had seen something new. Seeing God as Christ in all things brought together the cosmic, the human, and Christic dimensions. This was a powerful vision linked to experiences of a deeply mystical, or what one might call a panentheistic character. He was first able to describe this vision of what is sometimes called his gospel during the intensity and heightened experience of the First World War. It was a mystical vision of great power, a vision of fire whose blaze and radiant glow were alive in him to the very end of his life. He took to writing because he wanted to pass on this fire to others. He felt that those who possess the fire will inflame the world. Yet when you think that this celebration of life and its exuberance were expressed in the midst of the horror of the First World War, no wonder the French Catholic writer François Mauriac praised these essays, writings in time of war, when he wrote, I quote, the most optimistic view a Christian thinker has ever held of this criminal world was conceived at Verdun. 
This frantic cry of hope has been uttered from an abyss. The same sort of courage that was necessary to hold out in the trenches of Verdun was also necessary for conceiving thoughts as joyful as these, so permeated by hope. Teilhard considered it his vocation, his apostolate, he said, to spread abroad the fire, you, that is God, you have imparted to me. He wished to be, above all, the apostle, in if I dare to be so bold, the evangelist of your Christ in the universe. This is what he writes in the essay, The Priest. The impressions of the Great War were so overwhelming that he later felt that neither the attractions of Egypt, to which he had very much been attracted, neither the attractions of Egypt, where he had taught for three years in the Jesuit college, nor the intellectual stimulations of Paris, as where he was a student, where he undertook his scientific studies up to the doctoral level, were worse as much as the dreadful horror of war. As he wrote in one of his essays, when I look back, also written during the war, when I look back, all the magic of the East, all the spiritual warmth of Paris are not worth the mud of Dormont, the mud of Dormont where the battle for Verdun took place. Here in the battles of the First World War, he exercised his pastoral and priestly ministry for the first time to the full. And here, among all the painful suffering and loss of life, his great vision of humankind is truly one first emerge. As he so movingly describes in his 1918 essay, The Priest, during the Great War he was, he writes, submerged in the tears and blood of a generation. But in the end, he could pray this great ardor, I thank you, God, that you have made me a priest and a priest ordained for war. Happy are those among us who have been chosen to be in communion even unto death with the Christ who is being born and suffering in the human race. There's perhaps too much to read out here now, but I want to give you some more references because he had many, many references to the heart of Jesus, particularly later in the Mass on the World, but you have him also in the essay, Christ in the World of Matter. He, so he writes, What I discern in your breast, this is addressed to Christ, is simply a furnace of fire. And the more I fix my gaze on its ardency, the more it seems to me that all around it, the contours of your body melt away and become enlarged beyond all measure, till the only features I can distinguish in you are those of the face of a world which has burst into flame. So the heart of Jesus is here seen as a furnace of fire. It becomes a universal, a cosmic heart, the heart of God at the center of all things, the divine presence understood as a universal cosmic Christ. So the sacred heart, which is an old French, um, particularly French devotion, which he felt he had moved far away from, he interpreted or reinterpreted in cosmic evolutionary terms, but he equates this cosmic heart with the human heart of Jesus and the heart of the, re, re, the heart of the risen Christ radiating with the fire of love as the heart of matter. Now, when he came after the war, he was in great difficulty, and I, I want to conclude on this, in that he was, when he, when he got his a doctorate in 1922 in science, he was appointed as professor of, um, uh, of geology at the Institut Catholique, the Catholic University in Paris, where there are many Jesuit teachers. 
and he was delighted and he had at long last found a platform where he could really explain his ideas, explain the world in terms of evolution of becoming, but also explain what that meant in religious and spiritual terms, and that got him into trouble. And because this was not liked, and he, he wrote an essay, one of his friends, asked him to write what this meant in terms of the understanding of original sin. And he wrote a little essay, which is very brief, which he put in the drawer of his desk from where it was stolen and sent to Rome. And that, from then onwards, Thea was in the bad books. And he was really, really challenged. And he was asked to sign some statements that he would not, that he would not proclaim these newfangled ideas. And he really got into the greatest spiritual battle of his life in this because he lost his teaching position and he is now in his greatest crisis. What is he going to do? His friends advised him maybe he should leave the Jesuits. He writes to his Jesuit friend Auguste Valencin, which is the most sacred of my two vocations, the one that I followed as a youngster of 18 years, i.e. becoming a Jesuit novice, or the one that revealed itself as the true spouse in the fullness of my manhood, namely the vision of the unity of Christ and the universe. In other words, was being a Jesuit or a scientist his true vocation? In the end, he found this, his two great loves, in other words. In the end, he found the strength to remain faithful to both his great loves. He submitted to his superiors, but not without feeling tempted to keep the society of Jesus. He writes, I weighed up the enormous scandal and damage that an act of indiscipline on my part would have caused. He felt that this was perhaps the moment of the great choice of my life. These are all quotations from his letters. Could he be sure that he would not desert or leave prematurely? He asked Valencin, his friend Valencin, to pray for him, that come what may, I never let myself wish for anything but the fire. In spite of his disappointment, he was without rancor, for he felt supported by the sympathetic attitude of his immediate superiors and friends. He, was, he decided to return to China, where it was very convenient to be in exile, so to speak, because there was work for him, and he was far removed from Paris and all these struggles. But what he did when he returned to China, he worked through his own crisis by writing The Divine Milieu. This is how this book came into existence. He wanted to make it clear to himself how we can live and establish ourselves in the divine milieu, how we have to divinize our activities and our passivities, that which we do and what is done to us, and to show the attributes of the divine milieu, what he means by that, how we can contribute through our life to the growth of the divine milieu, and how the divinizations of passivities is really the harder part and the much larger part. We always think very actively that we are in charge and we're doing much more than we are suffering. But he shows, he doesn't mean passivity is just in the sense of suffering. Like so often he extends this concept, passivities, and he shows that really much more is given to us than we do ourselves. But life itself, we don't choose our parents, we don't choose our intelligence. We can work on it, we can work with it, but it is given to us. So he means passivity, that which is given to us, as well as things that are done to us in terms of suffering and pain, as well as the ultimate experience of death. So you have all these different kind of passivities, and he wants to see, he wants to teach how we can relate those in a constructive and creative way uh, to make them, if you like, moments of development development moments of grace. And that is the divine milieu. So that's a very, very important aspect of his work. And it came about, it is rooted in his own experience. Now, I want to just 
conclude and finish with the image of fire which still figures in the two important late essays of Teyas, The Heart of Matter which gives his spiritual development, written in 1950, and The Christic, written in 1955, six weeks before his death. The ardor of Teyas' pan-Christic mysticism, this is an um, expression which comes from Teyas himself and from the war period. The, the order of this pan-Christic mysticism, i.e. the consummation of the universe by Christ and of Christ by the universe, is described there by him as a glorious vision that he retained until the end of his life, a diaphany of the divine that had transfigured everything for him, as it does for all mystics. And in the Christics, uh, written so shortly before his death, he attests once more to, his all or to this all-consuming mysticism of fire. In 1923, he had finished the Mass on the World with the dedication, For me, my God, all joy and all achievement, the very purpose of my being and all my love for life, depend on this one basic vision of the union between yourself and the universe. It is to your body in this its fullest extension, that is to the world become through your power and my face the glorious living crucible in which everything melts away in order to be born anew. It is to this that I dedicate myself. It is in this dedication I desire to live. It is this in this dedication that I desire to die. So he lived with this mystical consciousness of union and communion, and he died with it. After his death, and this is quite extraordinary, a picture of the radiant heart of Christ was found standing on his desk, personally inscribed with my litany on the front and the back. I quote just a few lines. I, I find it's extraordinary. If you know about the story of the uh, 16th century French mystic Pascal, who comes from the aware and like Teilhard, and Teilhard is often compared to Pascal because he was, he was a mathematician, he was a mystic, and he wanted to convey to his contemporaries the love, his, the, real la, the real presence of this God of Abraham, Moses, and J Abraham, Jacob, and so on. And you have, you had in his, when he died, they found in the inside of his coat uh, this extraordinary mystical testimony that he had written down. Now, with Teya, it's not in the inside of his coat, but it is this picture on his desk that was found with this personal my litany on the front and the back. And I can only quote a few lines where it says, the God of evolution, the Christic, the trans Christ, heart of the world, Jesus, essence, motor of evolution, focus of ultimate and universal energy, center of the cosmic sphere of cosmogenesis, heart of Jesus, heart of evolution, Unite me to yourself. So, Teya uses images drawn from nature and the human body to express the powers of attraction, transformation, and consummation which the divine milieu so lastingly exercised on him. He frequently referred to the image of the fire, the vision of the burning bush on the mountain, and the chariot of fire, images drawn from the Hebrew Bible, which also figure prominently in Jewish mysticism. Then he speaks about mounting up, going up the mountain of transformation, seeing the ultimate illumination there. We are halfway up perhaps, but we are not there yet. Fire was more than an image to him. He had experienced the violent battles of the fire in the First World War when his mystical vision first burst forth and found its first expression. The fire image then stayed with him throughout his life. But in addition, he was much attracted by the image of the heart, as you have heard, the heart of Jesus, a human and cosmic heart, images that are also found in the mystical devotions of Orthodox Christianity. 
There's much in Thea's pancreastic mysticism which is Catholic in the widest, most universal sense of the word, while there are also many elements which give a new, extended meaning to the Christian experience of God in a world of evolutionary dynamic and becoming. Thea's pancreastic mysticism is a mysticism of transfiguration and transformation, just as he inscribed his early essays with the words, the great converters or perverters of human beings have always been those in whom the soul of their age burned the most intensely. We can say that while he felt most intensely with the contemporary world, he wanted to convert, not pervert, but lead people to the vision of divine fire, which more than anything else had inflamed the entire world for him. Thank you. That's it. I will, yeah, yeah okay. Discussion. You want to give people a chance to start, <laughs> to have yeah, a break? That's it. Okay, good. So thank you so much, Ursula. It was brilliant. And uh, don't you wish you could just be filled with that same kind of fire? I mean, it really does um, motivate you to do that. So why don't we take a few minutes at the tables and, um, you know, what is it that has moved your heart? Um, what questions do you have? You know, what would you like to know more about this amazing man who, um, who really did live what he uh, wrote? It came... I think I lost the microphone. There we go. Yeah, it really came from his heart and his, uh, you know, and... and um, and uh, his life. So um, take a few minutes. We won't go too long because I know it's late. But um, you know, think for a minute. You know, reflect on that, and then maybe discuss.
questions. Uh, I wonder if anyone would like to ask a question now. We'll take some time for that. I'll bring around a microphone if I can figure out how to turn it on. Is it? It's on? You can hear it. Would anyone like to ask a question or make a comment? Oh, too many. <laughs> one at a time. Thank, thanks, Kathy. Ursula, you were about to, I think you were about to tell us um, uh, Teilhard's idea of original sin that got put in the drawer and was spirited away. And I was waiting to hear what it was. <laughs> no, no, I, have, I haven't got my relevant paper with me. I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's not something I've extensively worked on. He hasn't got that much of original sin in his work. I don't think he was that interested in it, quite honestly. I mean, what he really objected to, I mean, the, the church can no longer maintain this today, is monogenism, i.e. the descent of the human race from one original couple, uh, and then the creation of the uh, world and all reality within six days, or seven, right. seven days, rather. You know, the, right. I mean, that was believed by many until earlier this in the 20th century so of that course. is what is really of course you know right. that's too static it's i've just been talking about yeah, this yeah that just what you said I, yeah. I mean i remember this quote he says uh, it, it, the original sin is a static solution to the problem of evil and now that we know about evolution we don't need it anymore which well, makes <laughs> perfect sense to me perfect sense yeah no, that so, was so, no. oh that's your question okay who else uh, yes, I was interested in knowing what is his standing in the church today and when did it shift from when his writings were criticized until now? Well, I don't know. It's very... Uh 
very mixed, very mixed, you know. <laughs> some more recent popes have expressed themselves somewhat more provingly and positively, including uh, Pope Francis has mentioned Teja in his encyclical, but uh, there's still a lot of work to be done, you know, because uh, once you say, well, people mustn't be, I mean, in 1962, we were talking about this before dinner, um, the monitum, from the Vatican that came out said that Teya must not be studied in seminaries, right? So there was this kind of module. But someone said this has never been taken back. I'm not so sure about this. There was not an official declaration. Now we are recognizing this is wrong. But there was more gradual acceptance and, and a possibility because I know many seminaries and many people who have studied Teya. I began in 1962 in a in a seminary of a sort at the Catholic Institute because uh, the wonderful thing was, this is an anecdote you might uh, like to hear, um, I was a student of theology at the Institut Catholique in Paris and our professor of theology, uh, who was a very dynamic Belgian, Pierre Paul Henri, who was the world authority on uh, Plotinus. He edited, together with a Swiss scholar, he edited the definite text of the of Plotinus's Enneads. He was a really international level. He was a f he, not a close friend, but he knew Teya and he tried to get some of Teya's writings that had been published because a few essays, not the early essays from the war, but other essays came out in some, you know, very marginal journeys, journals. So he had put them together and they had found a Swiss publisher to publish these essays. But then, and Teya was delighted, this is around about 1954, and Teya was delighted, and it's mentioned in the correspondence of he was absolutely delighted, but then, of course, you know, the hammer came down, no imprimatur can't be done, you know, no. The answer is no, as it had been all the time. No, not under any circumstances. But Paul Henri, who was a great admirer of TR, um, he was a real rebel, a real dynamic rebel. He said, right. I mean, he didn't say this to the students, of course, in this way, but Rome has spoken, he must not be taught in seminary. I'm going to give a series of lectures for the whole public of Paris. It's not to the seminary. I mean, the lectures took place in the same hall, but it's for not for the seminarians primarily, it's for the whole of Paris. So we all, of course, went to these lectures. <laughs> and he lectured for a whole week, and I mean, you know, all the stairs, the steps, you couldn't get into the hall. It was shock a block full with people up everywhere, everywhere, because this man was telling us about Teya and Teya's ideas at a time when very little had been published. And most of the things were still in cyclostyle form. And they were all with Mademoiselle Mortier, to whom he had made his legacy. He had made the testament that she should look after them. And uh, he lent me overnight. I was very privileged, not overnight, but for a few days, he lent me a cyclostyled copy of The Heart of Matter. These are the first words I ever read from Tia, and they completely illuminated and brought me over. I could not believe that someone could write this or even more experience this, you know. This was just like a lightning descending. And that started my studies on Thea. And when I organized uh, for Thea's centenary of his birth in 1981, I uh, organized a conference for the British Thea Association on Thea. And Christopher Mooney was supposed to be a speaker. And he sent his paper, but he was too ill to come. But we got a letter from some high cardinal I can't remember. I would have to look this up. And I have this letter somewhere, but not in my head from a cardinal to say, you know, how great Teya was. It wasn't, it wasn't officially taking back what was said in the monitor, but it was sort of more or less saying it's fine and we should study more and it would be great. And this was very reaffirming, right, and gave us a lot of encouragement and hope. And believe it or not, in 19... 79, I went with some British students on an official trip 
to the Soviet Union, to Moscow and to St. Petersburg, which was then Leningrad. And I marched independently into the academy, the, French, the Russian Soviet academy. I got into quite a bit of trouble. But anyway, I got there and I found out from the library and I asked, you know, I was showing up the library, everything was very grand and so on, and I found quite a lot of works I recognized which were exhibited. And I had the audacity to ask whether they had Teilhard de Chardin's works, or at least the books that had been published by them. And they showed me they had the phenomenon of man in French, but under lock and key. But I mean, Margaret Mead was also under lock and key. <laughs> <laughs> but they were there. So some of the extraordinarily eminent academicians, they could get the key and could study. Right, so it, you know, different things happen, and when you think Teilhard's works were not published, you must, you must know the extraordinary detective stories about what he called his clone star, his secret writings, which were almost like Soviet Samidas literature that was distributed underground, because from 19. 27 onwards or so, Simone Beguin, who was the wife of one of his closest friends, she had the idea of first just typing them, and then they started distributing them. And I think the first essay that really went round in quite a number of copies was How I Believe. That's now in 1934. And they did this from then regularly, and there was a whole coterie of people who collected these essays and archived them in their filing cabinets. So, for example, it says in the Big One correspondence, I think, that 1939, before the outbreak of the Second World War, Teilhard wrote an essay, Souvenir l'Humanité, we must, you know, let us save humanity, let us save humanity. And I think they produced something like 10,000 copies, and then I think, what a lot of work that must have been. This is before photocopying. And who were the 10,000 readers who got these copies? You know, you just have to think. So the divine milieu was copied many, many times and distributed to many friends. I mean, it went round, you know, if you want to read this, or oh, I'd like a copy. Let's make another copy. Let's make another copy. And that is how Mademoiselle Mortier, who was, who had been the secretary of the a Nobel Prize winner in literature, Romain Gonon, a very famous French writer, she had got hold of one of these copies of the Divine Milieu, and she wanted to absolute, she read this copy, and she wanted to meet the author of this work. And when Thea was one of these, on one of his visits to Paris and gave a lecture somewhere, she made sure she went to see this man and she talked to him. And she then offered, to cyclostyle these essays for him and his works for him. Because Simone de Beguin, she had by then moved to North Africa. She couldn't do it. So Mademoiselle Mortier takes on. And then in China, Lucille Swan, the American sculptor, she also typed a lot of these copies. You know, there's a whole sub-industry that took place. He surely well made sure, you know, and he would tell people, send so-and-so that essay, send so-and-so that essay. So there was plenty that was distributed, even though there was no publisher involved and no official publication. So you can see he had a, a certain circle of friends. I mean, he was not publicly known because publishers didn't publish him, but there was, you know, he wasn't just leaving everything in the cupboard. He had the mission, he felt this should be made known, and that is what in fact happened. Mm. So, Mademoiselle Mortier was then, she, before Teilhard went to South Africa in 1954, one of the Canon lawyers, in fact, someone who taught us canon law, he told Teilhard in the etude he should make sure that he left his essays to someone who would publish them, because a Jesuit certainly would not publish them. And he had seen Mademoiselle Mortier, she had come to say goodbye to him before he went to South Africa, and he then took a piece of paper with lesitude, letterhead, and he made his 
Testament there and then, giving Mademoiselle the right to publish all his works. The family was furious, mm. absolutely furious. Then they found out after his death, you see. But she had this piece of paper, and she was clever enough, she was so devoted to him, that she got a committee together of eminent scientists and theologians with the honorary president being the Queen of Belgium. I don't know why, don't ask me. And this committee, as soon as Teilhard was under the earth, they got the phenomenon of man out, you know, the human phenomenon. They were working quickly. This accounts for the shoddy way in which his works were published. But if that hadn't happened, they wouldn't have been published at all. But the Jesuits, they were very well clued up. I went to see, I went to interview his last superior, Père Duans, who wrote two very heartbreaking volumes later on called Teya, um, a, pro a prophet, a prophet on trial in the church of his times. And if you read this, this is reading like reading a detective story. When you then read all the vicissitudes and the nastiness and the, the things that this man suffered, it is unimaginable. These two volumes have never been published, never been translated into English. Now, Père Duins, who was the graciousness and loveliness himself, he told me personally, and I may have this on tape, he said, look at this filing cabinet. I had every essay stored in this. Don't you think I, I would not have burned these or cut them or thrown them away? I have saved up everything. It would have come out. It would have come out. That's what he told me in 1975. But whether it would have come out with the Jesuits, I don't know. I mean, it's a whole interesting story about these essays. But his ideas were known. And because he attracted so much um, publicity in Paris when he got back in 1946. This is why the Jesuits sent him packing again. They didn't want him there. They didn't want him to speak publicly to people. So uh, that's why he finished up in the States and died in New York. You know, otherwise he, he would have loved to have stayed in Paris, but he couldn't. Mm. Sorry, I'm going yes, on to one more on. question. This will be our last one, I think. There you go. Uh, I gather that. Uh, Tehar was a believer in creative evolution because you said tonight he was stimulated by uh, Bergson's yeah. book on creative evolution. My question to you is, did Tehar think that evolution was random or guided to some extent? Guided. I mean, he has a telos. His, his view is teleological, that there is... It is forward and upward. I mean, the question that we can't answer is what is the dimension of time involved in this? Is this another 13 billion years or how long will it take? But he basically, he basically felt that life has to be raised to a new stage, that there is a further evolution taking place, particularly at the cultural level, the, so at the social and cultural level, and that humanity has to come together on one earth and cooperate, and that the boundaries of nations and states are redundant. They were redundant for him in the 1930s. Well, we have had a second world war since, and we've had many more wars, and are having more wars right now. You see, he saw really a greater world. He saw that the evolution moves forward and upward, and for him, the ultimate um, process, ultimately the process of evolution is a process of spiritualization. You see, this is why he feels there is a telos, there is, he, he extrapolates the omega, there must be a summit, and from, given the perspective of his Christian faith, this summit is the summit of humanity coming, finding its fulfillment, all life, all the universe finding its fulfillment in God. So that is the summit. That's why he talks also about Christ, Omega, and so on. So he sees a telos, not a random, not random. I mean, it's random at the lower levels, and it's random if you look at you know, small parts, but not the total process, not the total process. Okay. Well, thank you, Ursula. And um, it's, it's been music to my ears. I don't know about yours. What do you say? <laughs>
Yeah, it's just so wonderful to, to k try to catch that fire again. Every time I read, or and, and Ursula is just so full of it herself, you know, so full of uh, the fire of Teilhard. So thank you very much for coming. I hope uh, I hope this new setup is good. If not, let us know. And um, do come back. We have our next next lecture is October 19. We're having Michael Mann, uh, a, a meteorologist, talking about the the problem of global warming dire predictions he calls it so that's the next one and we have a, a great um, set for the rest of the year so be sure to keep checking our website let me know if you don't if you're not able to get in okay have a safe trip home and thank you for, for everything thank you.